Without Matt's intervention, I might have succumbed to the despair, resorting to drastic measures like harming Deborah or myself to escape the nightmare. However, he shed light on the issues plaguing my life and guided me towards rectifying my past missteps. After enduring nearly three tumultuous years of marriage to Deborah, it became evident that I needed to reclaim control over my life and set it back on course. Reflecting on my past, it's apparent that I've often been under the influence of strong women, a pattern that likely began with my parents' separation, or rather, my father's sudden departure, when I was just 10 years old. Initially, my mother concealed the truth, claiming my father was away on business. However, as the weeks passed without his return, the reality set in. In hindsight, the signs were there all along. Their frequent arguments, the slamming of doors, it became so commonplace that I almost normalized it. Then, one fateful night, my father walked out with his suitcase, never to return. What struck me as odd was my mother's apparent lack of longing for him. She carried on as though nothing had changed, never entertaining the thought of another man in her life. She often assured me that I was the only man she needed and pledged to ensure my upbringing was exemplary. However, her dedication may have been excessive. She was perpetually dissatisfied. Even if I achieved B's, she demanded A's. The lawn could never meet her standards, and the house consistently fell short during her white glove inspections. Seeking refuge, I threw myself into sports and clubs, hoping to escape her relentless scrutiny. Yet, she always managed to intrude upon my peace. Securing a four-year scholarship to a college out of state felt like liberation, a chance to break free from her control. Yet, my mother found ways to maintain her grip on my life. Daily phone calls were mandatory, accompanied by her insistent demands for weekly grade updates. And once a month, regardless of my commitments, I was compelled to make the journey home to appease her. In hindsight, perhaps a college on the opposite coast would have been wiser. The first three years were a blur of academic pursuits and fulfilling my mother's endless requests. Then, in the fall semester of my senior year, I encountered Deborah. Enthralled by her beauty, I was instantly captivated. We shared an accounting class, and I often found myself seated directly behind her, intoxicated by her perfume for the entire hour. Despite having dated a few girls over the years, none had captured my interest like Deborah. While I wasn't unattractive, I certainly didn't possess the allure of a handsome heartthrob. Standing at 5'10 and weighing no more than 175 pounds, I considered myself lean and fit. However, Deborah always seemed to attract the attention of jocks and well-dressed suitors. Two weeks remained before the semester's conclusion when, at the class's conclusion, she swiveled in her seat to face me. It felt like a sudden jolt to the heart. Hi, my name is Deborah Perez, she greeted, extending her hand. I stumbled over my words as I introduced myself as Terry Flores and reciprocated the handshake. I know who you are. Everyone in class knows who consistently tops the grades every semester, she remarked. I was wondering if you had any free time. I'm facing some difficulties in a few areas and thought perhaps you could lend me a hand, she requested. My heart raced as I assured her that I had some spare time and would gladly assist her. Why don't we meet in the library after dinner? I can help clear up any problem areas you're struggling with, I suggested, flashing my most confident smile. That initial encounter sealed my fate. I found myself utterly smitten. Anything she asked, I would have done without hesitation, and Deborah was never one to shy away from asking. Our relationship progressed, and within a couple of months, we became an item, albeit one on her terms. Despite this, she still enjoyed weekends out with her predominantly male group of friends. Deborah, I feel uneasy about you spending every weekend with someone else, I expressed one night. I'm your boyfriend, shouldn't I be the one taking you out on weekends? I questioned. Terry, don't you trust me? Do you think I'm being unfaithful? If you don't trust me, maybe we should call it quits, she retorted. Deborah, I never implied I didn't trust you. I simply want to spend more of my free time with you, that's all, I reassured her. Terry, right now your academic pursuits should take precedence. You're leading our class. Are you willing to risk that for a movie or dinner? She queried. I suppose you're right, but I miss you terribly, I confessed.
I know you do, but once we graduate, you'll have all the time with me. For now, I want you to focus on your studies so you can have your pick of opportunities, she reasoned, planting a kiss on my lips. Don't you want to make me happy? Deborah, you mean everything to me, and rest assured, no one else even comes close, I assured her. And indeed, no one did. I graduated at the top of my class and received numerous outstanding job offers. Do I sound like a lovesick fool? Well, that's exactly what I was, completely and utterly. Deborah was now calling all the shots, and I was following along as if I were tethered by a ring through my nose. But in my deluded mind, I believed I was happy, or so I thought. When I introduced Deborah to my mother, I braced myself for potential conflict, but to my surprise, they hit it off immediately. They conversed mostly about me, both agreeing that I needed strong guidance, but had immense potential. Hope you two haven't made plans for sleep, my mother inquired. No chance of that until our wedding night, Deborah informed her. Good. I managed to keep his father in line by controlling when and if he got any, my mother disclosed to Deborah. Before I knew it, they were planning my future together. Deborah had brought along all my job offers, and she and my mother spent the weekend scrutinizing each one, deciding which offer I should accept. I could feel the metaphorical collar tightening around my neck with each passing moment. It was bad enough that they hand-picked the job offer I would inevitably accept, but to top it off, they had already set a tentative wedding date while I found myself catering to their every whim. I hadn't even proposed to Deborah, yet here we were, the three of us scheduled to go ring shopping on Saturday. I knew I should have spoken up, but every attempt was met with resistance from both women. I was truly a spineless pushover. Over the next 12 months, here's what ensued. Deborah and I tied the knot, and I began the job she and my mother had chosen for me. Meanwhile, Mom sold the house and relocated to a condo conveniently close to our new home, Deborah's personal selection. Deborah secured a job in marketing, and suddenly, everything revolved around her. She dictated our finances, our meals, our social circle, and even the frequency of our intimacy, which dwindled to almost nothing. After being rejected for the fifth consecutive time one evening, I voiced my frustration loudly. In response, Deborah lashed out and struck me across the face with force. Who do you think I am? Some streetwalker? I'm your wife and I demand to be treated as such. If you ever expect to be intimate with me again, you had better start showing me a lot more respect, she admonished me with raised voice. It was yet another month before I had any intimacy with Deborah again. I couldn't comprehend how she could endure such abstinence. She was insatiable in bed, often leaving me drained and spent before she was satisfied. I was puzzled, but my confusion soon dissipated. As part of her job, Deborah frequently attended seminars and trade shows. I had the displeasure of meeting her boss once, and my impressions of him were consistent. He was a genuine jerk. When I expressed my distrust and dislike for him, Deborah dismissed my concerns, asserting that I only needed to trust her. Terry, do you honestly believe I would cheat on you? Haven't we had this conversation before? If I were ever unfaithful, you would be the first to know, she reassured me. Eight months later, she returned from a trip in unusually high spirits. I'm in line for a promotion, she informed me, her face glowing with excitement. I'm not entirely sure of the details, but it seems like I'm on the path to climbing the corporate ladder, she exclaimed. I'm relieved you'll be distancing yourself from Charlie. I never trusted him, I admitted. Terry, I'll still be working under Charlie, but I'll be responsible for organizing all the displays for our marketing shows, she revealed, her smile unwavering. Although I did have to sleep with him to secure the position. What? I erupted in disbelief. Lower your voice, Terry. I won't tolerate you shouting at me like this, she retorted sharply. You slept with that jerk, I pressed. There were two of us vying for the position, and I made a deal with him that if he gave it to me, I'd sleep with him. Deborah explained calmly, as if narrating a bedtime story. So this morning, before we left for home, I followed through, and now I've secured the job. Isn't it fantastic? She asked, seemingly oblivious to my distress. I sank into a chair, feeling as though my world was crumbling around me. My beloved wife was no longer entirely mine. 
All I wanted to do was cry. Terry, it was just one time. I don't love him, only you. I did it for us. Think of all the extra income I'll be bringing in now, she continued, attempting to rationalize her actions. Deborah, you cheated on me, and no amount of money can change that. I don't care about the damn money. All I care about is you, or at least I used to, I confessed. Terry, I've said it before, I would never deceive you, and if I ever did anything wrong, you'd be the first to know. I'm not proud of what I did, but it was for us, can't you see that? She pleaded. What's next? Are you going to sleep with the entire sales force? I retorted incredulously. Terry, what's gotten into you? It was a one-time thing, and it won't happen again, she assured me. But I could no longer trust a single word she said, because it did happen again, just two months later. We found ourselves at a company gathering hosted by her boss. I could sense the judgmental stares, with half viewing me as a pushover, allowing her boss to have his way, and the other half perhaps pitying me. With Charlie's wife away, the sales team kept me occupied throughout the evening, each member taking their turn to divert my attention. Meanwhile, Deborah was likely occupied in one of the upstairs bedrooms, entertaining her boss and who knows who else. I reached my breaking point and decided to leave, abandoning Deborah at the party. She called me twice, but I chose to ignore her. Maybe she needs a change of clothes, I reasoned to myself. Three hours later, Charlie dropped her off. You left me. How could you do that? She erupted in anger. I was so embarrassed. I suppose I'm not as embarrassed as I should be to know you're upstairs with the entire sales team, I shot back. I refuse to entertain these absurd accusations, she spat as she turned to ascend the stairs. At least tonight, I won't have to settle for being your second choice, probably fifth or sixth, I retorted, my frustration boiling over. After all I had been through, I slept in the spare bedroom. Deborah tried to talk me back into her bedroom, but I told her I didn't want to get an STD from her. She used to get angry only 30% of the times at me, now it was more like 75%. And if that wasn't bad enough, my mom got on my case about Deborah and took her damn side. You know Terry, sometimes you have to make sacrifices to succeed in the business world. There's nothing wrong with it, especially when it involves your wife, my mother reasoned. Is that what you told dad? Is that why he left mom? I challenged her. Her reaction was one of shock. Don't you ever speak to me like that again, she yelled, attempting to strike me. I caught her hand. Don't you dare try that again, or I might just forget your ring mother, I warned, releasing her grip. You and Debra are two peas in a pod. Both of you believe the ends justify the means, but not in my book. Following that altercation, our relationship was strained at best. My mother remained perpetually angry with me for various reasons, and despite my newfound resentment towards Debra, she still held sway over our household. It became increasingly clear to me that Debra didn't care about me, and perhaps she never did. Yet I lacked the courage to confront the situation, until I met Matt and began spending more time with him instead of going home. After a few drinks one evening, I found myself pouring my heart out to Matt. Terry, why don't we head to your place so I can sleep with your wife? He suggested casually, a smile playing on his lips. I stared at him in disbelief as he returned my gaze with a smirk. It sounds just as ridiculous coming out of my mouth as it probably does coming out of hers. Honey, it was a one-time thing. It's all lies and deep down, you know it. You've been under some woman's thumb for so long, you've lost sight of which way is up, Matt remarked, hitting the nail on the head. If I had the guts, I'd put a bullet through her and Charlie's heads for what they've done to my so-called marriage, I confessed to him. What marriage? You don't have a marriage, and you probably never did. It's more like your mom and Deborah had a marriage, and you were just along for the ride. How often do you even share a bed with her? He inquired. About once a month, until that last party last month, and now not at all, I admitted. Well, that's the first thing we need to address. We need to get you laid, Matt declared. Three hours later, I lay on the bed beside a fetching blonde, still trying to catch my breath. That was incredible. I almost forgot what it felt like, I confessed to her. You're not bad. With a little practice, you could be great, she complimented me. 
With her words of encouragement, we delved into another round, this time with me taking the lead. As soon as I walked through the door, Deborah launched into a tirade. Why the hell are you out so late? Don't you realize I had dinner waiting for you? She barked. So, I retorted, cutting her off. Well, I tossed yours in the trash. If you want anything, you'll have to make it yourself, she informed me sharply. I'm not hungry. I already ate something before I got home, and it was delicious, I informed her. So, if you don't mind, I'm feeling exhausted and I think I'll turn in, I added, heading upstairs. I had no desire to engage in a verbal sparring match with her tonight, and she wasn't pleased about it. After showering and tidying up, I climbed into bed. About half an hour later, Deborah entered my room. Want to fool around tonight? She asked, flashing a smile. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm not in the mood for sloppy seconds tonight, but I appreciate the offer. I declined. Damn you, Terry. I haven't been with anyone else tonight, she snapped. If you don't believe me, you can check for yourself. Sorry, not interested. But if you're feeling frisky, you could always ring up Charlie, I remarked coolly. Damn you. It'll be a cold day in hell before you see me without clothes again, she spat before storming out of the room. After work, I filled Matt in on all the details. We shared a laugh and clinked our beer bottles, finishing off what was left in them. You know you've got to sever all the ties she has on you and fast, before she has a chance to strike back. Credit cards, life insurance, 401k, bank accounts, all of it needs to be dissolved before she catches on, Matt advised. We made a list and except for the house, I could handle everything remotely from work. It took me two days to complete all the tasks. Deborah didn't venture out during the week, so she wouldn't suspect anything until the weekend. I divided everything in half and converted it all into cash to make it untraceable. Despite my efforts, Deborah continued to berate me at every opportunity, even enlisting my mother to support her cause. During dinner on Wednesday, they both harped on me about still sleeping in the spare room. A husband belongs in bed with his wife, my mother insisted. How do you expect to resolve your issues if you don't work on it? She lectured me. Mom, Deborah's bed is usually pretty crowded. I'd probably have to kick out a few guys just to find a spot to lie down. I quipped with a smile. And frankly, I'm tired of being an afterthought, I added. I'm not involved with anyone. Deborah's voice echoed through the house. But if you're not interested anymore, I can easily find someone who is, she retorted sharply. Well, that certainly doesn't make me eager to be with you. Anyway, if you'll excuse me, I'm heading out tonight and I'd rather not be delayed, I responded calmly. Where do you think you're going? They both demanded to know. Just out, I replied casually. Maybe I'll work on some marketing displays, I added sarcastically as I ascended the stairs to my room. Twenty minutes later, I descended dressed impeccably. If you're cheating on me, Stephen Flores, I'll make you regret it, Deborah threatened. And what exactly would you do with that information? You haven't shown any interest in my intimate parts for months, but I guess to you, one set of balls looks much like another, I quipped. Enjoy the rest of your evening, I concluded, leaving the house. He's cheating on me, Deborah shrieked. Deborah, really think about who you're talking about. Do you honestly believe Terry has the nerve to cheat on you? My mother interjected with a snicker. With that, Deborah laughed out loud. I guess you're right, Mom, but he must be horny as a goat by now. Maybe I'll sneak into his bed tonight and give him a little taste, just enough to whet his appetite again, she told her. Besides, I've got my yearly review next week, and it's going to take everything I've got to get the increase I'm looking for. After that, I'm looking at starting a family. With a couple of kids, that should cement our marriage, she said fully knowing I wouldn't desert her after we had kids. Debra, please tread carefully. I have a feeling Terry's brewing something. I can't put my finger on it, but knowing my son, he's definitely scheming, my mother cautioned. Matt was amusing our companions as I approached the table. Apologies for my tardiness. Getting here took longer than anticipated, I explained. I'm just relieved you're here, Janice responded. The band is gearing up, and I wouldn't want to miss a single dance. Ditto, I replied, planting a kiss on her cheek and drawing her close. Easy there, tiger. 
can serve your energy for later. For now, let's hit the dance floor, she teased, and so we did for the next couple of hours. The final dance was a slow, gentle number, and I held Janice close. Our affection for each other was palpable, and half an hour later, we found ourselves in the bedroom. She was absolutely stunning. You'll still need leverage on her to sway things your way, Matt advised me. I think it's time for you to take a trip out of town, maybe a two-nighter. Matt, I never travel, I chuckled. Accountants don't wander, we're more at home crunching numbers in our caves, I joked. She doesn't know that, and there's always a first time, he countered, grinning. So together, we devised my getaway plan. I'll be out of town all day Wednesday and Thursday, but should be back Friday morning, I informed Debra. There's a seminar on the new computer software we'll be using next year. And why should I care? Should I throw a party? Debra retorted in her typical sarcastic manner. I just thought you might want to be aware of my whereabouts. What's the difference? You won't even share a bed with me anymore, and I have no clue what you're up to in that room. You could be sneaking women in for all I know, Deborah shot back. Rest assured, no woman has entered my bedroom. Can you say the same? I challenged. If I had someone in my room, you'd know it. Remember how loud I used to be, she said, unbuttoning her top. Want to give it a go before you leave town, she suggested. Here's the deal, Deborah. Get yourself checked out and show me a clean bill of health, then I'll consider it. Until then, I wouldn't touch you with a ten-foot pole, I retorted sarcastically. Damn you, Terry. I couldn't care less if I never sleep with you again. It's your loss, not mine, she spat angrily. Your charming attitude still intact, I see. Perhaps if your parents had disciplined you better, things might be different. But I doubt it. I have no idea what I ever saw in you. You were a scheming troublemaker then, and you're still one now. I was blind before, but I'm glad I finally woke up, I told her. So go ahead, do whatever you please, because I'm done caring, I declared, slamming the bedroom door in her face. You're damn right I will, so damn you Terry, she yelled at the closed door. I left the house early and met Matt for breakfast. It's all set, and I've pissed her off enough that I know she'll bring someone home today, I just hope it's Charlie. I'd love to punish the bastard, I told Matt. So, after work, around 5 o'clock, we made our way to our favorite watering hole. We enjoyed dinner, and then, using Matt's car, we drove over to my house and positioned ourselves just out of sight. We didn't have to wait long. Thank the heavens, I muttered to myself as Charlie's Lincoln pulled into my driveway. I snapped a few pictures of him arriving, stepping out of the car, and exchanging kisses with the scantily clad Deborah standing in the doorway. I'll handle the camera, but I brought a little something extra tonight, just in case things get dicey, Matt said, passing me a stun gun, the kind that shoots out barbs. Charlie might be bigger than both of us, but he's not too big for one of these, he added with a chuckle. We sneaked into the house and gave them plenty of time to get started. Knowing Deborah, she was probably pouring her heart out to him as we waited. Silently, we ascended the stairs, the sounds of their activities growing louder. After two minutes, we entered the room and started recording them. Charlie, I expected more from you. I mean, based on what Deborah told me about you, I thought you'd be packing something like 14 inches and 2 inches thick. I quipped, breaking the tense silence. Charlie turned around so Matt got a great shot of both their faces. I'm going to kill you, you little bastard, he shouted. But I had other ideas. I pulled the trigger and fired the stun gun. Both barbs slammed into him, and he shuddered. I released the trigger as he came down on it. I should get one of those for myself, I told Matt as Charlie began to slowly come to his senses. You're dead. Charlie managed to growl before I pressed the trigger again, causing him to black out. Matt, help me. We need to dispose of this mess, I instructed. Together, we dragged Charlie out of the front door and laid him on the lawn, followed by Deborah. I tossed their clothes on top of them and hurried back inside. Locking and bolting the door, I called 911, reporting a break-in with a possible firearm involved. Within minutes, police arrived at my driveway. I recounted to the police how I had caught my wife red-handed with her boss, prompting me to eject them both from my residence. The officers promptly instructed them to leave, 
warning of potential arrest if they refused. Dempera put up a fuss, but eventually departed, destination unknown. The following day was a whirlwind of activity. With the incriminating photos in hand, my attorney wasted no time in filing for divorce, submitting the papers to the court. Charlie received a serving of alienation of affection papers at his workplace, and a copy was hand-delivered to his wife. Additionally, their employer was served with legal documents, as the affair involving Charlie, the entire sales team, and Deborah led to a lawsuit against the company. The process of sorting out the legal paperwork took nearly two months. Deborah received half of what remained in our savings and half of the house's equity. She grumbled about wanting more, but I informed the court that a substantial amount had been spent gathering evidence. With no record of where the money had gone, I emerged unscathed. Charlie and most of the sales team faced termination. Charlie's wife, represented by my attorney, swiftly divorced him. The company opted to settle for a substantial five-figure sum, along with covering my attorney's fees, resulting in a significant win for me. Surprisingly, Deborah temporarily bunked with my mom, but it wasn't long before they drove each other mad. I suppose two strong personalities can't coexist under one roof. As for me, I'm still taking things slow with Janice. Everything I've ever wanted seems to be falling into place, and discussions about the future are underway, though the idea of marriage still nags at me. Matt and I occasionally grab a drink after work, but he's mentioned his new girlfriend is giving him a hard time. I just smirk at him and jest, you're whipped, aren't you? Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, Please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.